everybody! Welcome to Pale in Comparison. In this podcast, my sister uses her knowledge of the other verse to take a look at Tact, while those least appreciated work, and I try to not give away any spoilers. I'm Jenny, and Malia convinced me to read more. I'm Malia, and Jenny convinced me to read everything else. This episode, we are covering Bonds, chapters 1.6 and 1.7. Before we get into that, however, I'd like to issue a spoiler warning. This podcast is filled with pale spoilers. If you don't know whether Aunt Heather is secretly a practitioner and don't want us to tell you, stop now, read Pale, and come back to this podcast. As for Pact, there will be full spoilers through the chapters that we are covering. Yay, I was excited for you to read these <laughs> chapters. So, it was very exciting. <laughs> so, all right, well, I'll go over a quick, I guess, chapters summary, and then we'll get into talking about it, okay? Mm-hmm. So... Basically, for Bonds 1.6 and 1.7, we start off, Blake tries to order a pizza and fails dreadfully. Uh, Blake and Rose start to prepare to do the awakening ceremony when they stumble across a startling note with a key to the tower room attached. Blake impulsively decides to check it out with basically no preparation. He survives and gets chewed out by Rose. They read up on the tower demon and then awaken, though it appears not to work for Rose. Mm. I guess we'll start out with what kind of pizza do you think Blake ordered that he never got? Oh, that's really interesting. The real question, right? I don't, I don't like this thought, but Blake strikes me as just like a, like a pepperoni pizza kind of person. Okay. Like basic bitch. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with the basic bitch pepperoni. See, my, <laughs> I my love pepperoni pizza. So my boyfriend really likes it. pepperoni pizza with like roasted garlic. Cause he's a bougie, Cause he's basic bougie. bitch. <laughs> he's adding some pizzazz you know in four years when he finally reads pale and listens to this podcast he might be annoyed anyway i don't like pepperoni pizza because i find it too greasy like i like what pepperoni on pizza is great but it needs other things because like pepperoni pizza is too greasy and i don't like it i like all the toppings i also like the weird pizzas with like goat cheese and crap i mean i like that stuff too but like i mean i guess i i do get what you mean it can get pretty greasy but like why you have like paper towels and all that i mean i guess it's not fun to have to like wipe off your food before you eat it. yeah and if you just add like you know bell pepper or mushroom or even sausage or something it like really helps yeah sausage and pepperoni really it does i don't know why <laughs> the sausage so soaks up the grease yeah okay whatever you say that's a bunch of crap <laughs> okay that does not cut down on the grease I don't know what kind of. <laughs> well, <laughs> must be having some magic mushrooms before you eat that pizza because, like, it does it does something. I don't know. It does something. <laughs> <laughs> they got a basic bitch pepperoni, which again I think is delicious. <laughs> and Emily is too pretentious eat for it. that. Apparently, <laughs> yeah. Whatever. Okay. Anyway, so <laughs> yeah. So then he. It's like, oh, there's a bunch of others outside that look kind of hostile. Maybe we shouldn't have ordered delivery. Rose is like, yeah, why did you ask for pizza? Pizza isn't supplies. It's like, that's rude. Like, <laughs> let him order his pizza, Rose. Like, he has to eat. This is all. I, I also sort of agree that this could be a good testing the water situation because, like, it, he's going to need food eventually. And it might be a good idea to see how he can acquire it. I mean, unless, like, he schedules all of his grocery shopping in, like, the six hours around the council meeting, which I guess could be legit. But then if everyone fucking hates his guts like the pizza guy does, like, I don't know, they might not let him buy groceries. So Yeah, poor Blake. It sucks. <laughs> the first call that we see was interesting because it's it made it seem like that this guy is in on it, that he knows about the others and stuff. And like a touch of a bad accent. Like I was thinking, has this call been intercepted by one of the practitioners involved or by one of the others involved to like fucking prank Blake out of his mind or whatever. I was annoyed that Blake didn't comment more about like whether the voices answering the phone and stuff were different because it makes it seem like, cause he's just like, <laughs> we can't refund your order. Lol. And then the way that the others react at the end once they reveal that it was a really horrifying joke. He got punked hard. Yeah. That, like, I feel like the calls were to different people almost. Like, or, like, different people answered. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of the vibe I got as well. Yeah. One was was other, the other person was just kind of a dick. Yeah. But, you know. Yeah, and then Rose got to take a shower, which was nice. But yeah, I thought it was really interesting because Blake starts asking her about how do you know you're nervous and how do you, you know, because she was like, oh, I'm so nervous or whatever. And I thought it was really interesting because she... Like, so in therapy, right, I I go to therapy sometimes for anxiety and they talk to me about like noticing when I'm anxious and like that it's really important to like recognize that. And they're like, how do you know? Like, I'm like, oh, I'm feeling anxious about this or whatever. And they're like, okay, how do you know? And oh, it's almost always physical symptoms that I'm describing, right? Like, I'm like, oh, my eyelid twitches and I have acid reflux and, you know, blah, 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 blah. And so it was like, I was really trying to I mean, I believe Rose. I believe she knows that she's nervous or anxious or whatever. But I also trying to imagine that without having physical sensations was really interesting. And I really appreciated that, like, like she was showering to try to reconnect with her body sort of and to, like, try to feel normal. And I just like that sucks. But also, like, I'm glad that she's trying and doing that and stuff. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And it, like, brain feels anxious. I mean, I feel like. Pretty much most of the time when we feel anxious, there's physical symptoms along with it. And I'm, I'm mm-hmm. sure that we all, if we got rid of, or at least for me, I'm sure if I got rid of the physical symptoms, I probably would know what that felt like. Because mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sure our brains are anxious underneath that, but just the physical symptoms are so strong, you know, can't really, like, kind of drowns everything else out. Right. That's really what you're feeling. Right. I mean, like, maybe your thoughts would be racing or really focused on something or you'd like mm-hmm. have emotions. Right. But it's just it's interesting trying to, like, separate that from your body. True. That's yeah, pretty interesting to think about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So while they're waiting for the pizza, they, like, talk about Johannes and the domain and stuff. This was exciting. I get to learn what the domain ritual is and how it really, like, functions um, mm-hmm. I think with more detail than I'd ever learned and it was exciting just like here you go information on a platter um, <laughs> Yay! but you kind of magically mark out your space and then you say like this is my space and then everybody is like "Ooh, no it's not and like shows up and challenges you and I liked that it wasn't just like combat that there were like you know there could be puzzles or like different things like different types of challenges um, because mm-hmm. like not all others or practitioners or whatever are probably that good at combat. And so it was nice, like yeah. with the variety or whatever. And it, it made me really excited thinking about Verona doing this um, in Kennet, but then it also made me really suspicious, right? Like, is this an ex like with Matthew and Edith, would that be an excuse for them to challenge her? If she like had this house and then set up her domain. Cause like they didn't say like, and we won't try to take it back or something. Or is she kind of protected mm. being in Kennet? Or is it, like, worse being in Kennet? I mean, also, like, the Carmine energy, she should not do this right now. <laughs> it sounds horrible. Yeah. <laughs> She'd have a lot of challengers, I feel like. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I also think that they start talking about their, the three big rituals or whatever, and how, like, they feel like, like, Blake and Rose, and how they feel like they need um, one to get leverage and power to do the other ones and Blake's mm-hmm. like well what if we just do this one really shitty and then this one like kind of okay and then the third one will be great and I'm like no please don't do that like <laughs> no I mean I guess in a way that's kind of compromising with what Rose was trying to say yeah <laughs> but I mean it's just it's really hard because they need an external power source and I don't mm-hmm. want that power source to be demons but like is gonna be demons <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be demons because like what else that's what they got like, Johannes yeah. had, like, sneak attack domain where he somehow blocked other people from realizing that he was claiming a huge area. But then also because it's such a huge area and there's a whole bunch of people in it, it seems like he maybe doesn't have quite as much control over it. But he also has to, like, claim the th- and, like, defend it like a trademark. That was a funny comment. Yeah. So, like, because they were kind of talking about him like he was kind of a newcomer to the area, right? Mm-hmm. So do you have any thoughts about, I mean, I, this is kind of an unfair question because it's like so early and you know nothing about him, but like any I know thoughts he sucks. about <laughs> Well, like, ha, like, how do you think he could have gotten a domain that huge? Uh, grandma's notes are like, Mara was quieter than normal. And I'm like, hmm, is Mara like the rabbit girl, like the nature woman 
who like is like one of the like empty spaces between the countries in like last week's metaphor and if so mm. like did he make some sort of like deal with her to claim this like vast space hmm. i'm also confused as to how this expansion thing works uh it almost seems like just like suddenly one day there was a whole bunch of like crap like did they like knock down a hill or something like they want to do with like the hillsblade house uh did because it seems like it was somehow muted or blocked like people couldn't hear about the domain but also it's not mm -hmm. like it's not like this impenetrable fortress domain because like people just kind of go there and live there and work there and and there's like i like the idea of like a fiefdom where there's different others and practitioners managing different parts of the domain was really interesting but then i'm like what if one of mm -hmm. them wants a domain it's really they can't have one inside of your domain yeah yeah definitely interesting to think about mm -hmm. um i guess just keep thinking about that as we go on if you have come up with any new developments or theories let us know yeah johannes just seems incredibly impressive um because like his familiar is a gatekeeper of the seventh ring which you learn about in like the astral plane blah 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 and like that sounds really impressive and then like the pied piper reference where he has um and a pipe implement like like the pipes uh and he like you know leads people off to their death or whatever the fuck that was funny but and then like his huge domain it's just like who who did this man make deals with i don't know read over that familiar part again did they say anything else about that or like he's a large any thoughts about what what that afghan means? hound i mean it, it sort of reminds me of like the seventh circle of hell but it sounded more like something to do with like stars and like deities and like constellations mm -hmm. Astral bodies. yeah okay. keeper of the seventh ring okay yeah so what would you if you had to give me a big bold prediction right now about <laughs> what that familiar is would you just say screw you i'd Jenny. say like I'm not gonna give you one it's a constellation okay so it, that's it, pretty cool yeah so well uh this reminds me of the dragon prince which is like kind of a somewhat obscure show maybe it's on netflix y'all should watch it it's cute um it's cute but it's uh no i don't want to talk about it because it's sort of spoilers it's sort of spoilers for the dragon prince there's this evil seeming antagonist dude who's like a star elf dude and i have like big strong vibes like these like johannes and the big the, the star guy okay vibe or at least the familiar and the star guy so you feel like so you feel like <laughs> johannes is like viren <laughs> <laughs> uh i don't think that their relationship is that unbalanced but Kind of, I guess, yeah. <laughs> you kind of is like, done. <laughs> well, <laughs> that, that's it. <laughs> that's, that's where they got the idea for the dragon prince, like for that whole thing from from Pact. Sure. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, I would know because I read it. So, yeah. no. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, trademarks. Um, people, you hear about trademarks as being things people have to defend all the time right um or you you lose them so the common examples okay. are like kleenex instead of like facial tissue or whatever and like band-aid instead of like mm -hmm. adhesive whatever the crap and like i can't even think of what the generic names for these things are right i just say band-aid yeah. and yet i can't think of a single like trademark that's lost their trademark even though they've become like so common like a household name yeah yeah um and so I wonder, can <laughs> practitioners really lose their domains in this way? I mean, I guess. Mm. Especially a, such a big one. But it it's also, there's been talk on the Discord about Verona, or somewhere, about Verona possibly getting a domain and how that's, like, possibly unethical because, like, Crooked Rook is, like, once you take over this piece of land as a practitioner, like, it can't really be reverted back. Like, practitioners taking this land is like somewhat yeah. irreversible and i was like well alexander's domain like collapsed but then it was like oh but maybe it didn't like fully collapse actually this might have just been straight up in the pale reflections episode sorry y'all um <laughs> it was a really good one <laughs> if it was it's it's really interesting thinking about domains which i still don't understand and like if johannes's domain falls would that 
revert to what it was before or what the like you know if he didn't die if it just like if he lost it or whatever like is that a way mm-hmm. to get practitioners uh domains away from you know i don't know i don't know because i feel like the domain um like in in pale when they had that one example where they were talking about like how a bunch of different practitioners i think in the same family like kept doing domains like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. all just like to block this area off so even after they died it was still like a protected space right Mm -hmm. so i think in that sense like maybe it's still not a safe spot for others so in that sense like it's kind of taken away right and even in the house grandma was like everywhere in the house has been claimed you have to go somewhere else and i'm like yeah what what okay i accept like should just build an extension (laughs) like put another tower in like, like i don't know yeah, I mean, it, since the land isn't protected, why don't they just sell, like, a little bit of it and build a tower on their house? That's true. I mean, yeah. I mean, they could have done that, and I'm just, like, being really sneaky, so. Yeah. I, I mean, that, that's not that sneaky that I just said that, but <laughs> anyway. <laughs> well, it's, I guess one last thing before I move on from this, like, a another big thought I have is, like, Johannes claimed this huge area before the expansion quote unquote like happened or whatever and people Mm -hmm. want Hillsglade house to go away so that the expansion quote unquote so like that the town can expand more and I'm wondering like who's fucking around behind Hillsglade house trying to establish like another huge domain um because that seems like Mm -hmm. if I was a practitioner in that area I'd be like man I should do this or stop someone else from doing this yeah but also there's a demon in the attic and you can't get rid of it and I don't know what to do Way to jump ahead. <laughs> Sorry. All right, we still have really to talk excited. about pizza, okay? Um, pizza. <laughs> uh, let me see. That's awesome. So, um, anyway, to kind of move on, they also get in kind of a another mini argument about becoming witch hunters. Rose really, really <laughs> likes this idea. Blake is not really feeling it. Yeah, I... Um... I'm still confused as to what the protection witch hunters have, quote unquote, is if it's not innocence. And I think it might be. And like, it's too late, Rose. I mean, like, especially by the end of this, I think that witch hunters and practitioners are not the same. Yeah. The, uh, you read the last, the latest chapter in Pale, right? Um, is that Sig's interlude? Yeah. Yeah. Which is Okay, so just to... For everyone, we're recording um, when that's the latest chapter for, to be released. Um, but the like, there's a witch hunter, and it was exciting. But also, they talk about witch hunters as being against practitioners and others. Like, it seems like witch hunters are not practitioners, and I don't get it. Um, yeah, but I just it seems like it's too late. I mean, for, for Blake and Rose. Yeah, Blake did. He basically was like, "Did you even read anything about witch?" Like one shutter, and she's like, "No, because you won't turn the mirror." So I'm like, "Yeah, she doesn't really." I feel like she's kind of getting ahead know. of herself a little bit. Cause she doesn't really know anything about it. But on the other hand, she does have a point that it'd be kind of good to read about it <laughs> to get more options. Yeah. But um, yeah, yeah, like I mean, you might decide after reading it that that's not really what you want to do. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, they kind of talk about all this stuff, and then they see what they think is the pizza guy's car. <laughs> uh, pull up to the house and they're like oh fuck <laughs> what do you think about this part Malia <laughs> when you were reading this for the first time were you just like really confused and horrified or? I, I was very horrified it was very visceral and the whole time I was like no but they can't like I was just kind of like they can't do this like whatever like this can't be happening right like unless i don't understand what's going on at all like yeah they can't just fucking murder a pizza guy because the innocence right like you know others have to protect innocence too because the seal and like all those complicated things and so i was just like this can't be happening but also like the grabbed the wrist and impaled his hand on the spike and then like took his head and started bashing it in and then the woman reaches into his eyes and moves around and then the skin and like and then they pretend to be making out to hide the fact that they're others (laughs) and then continues to do things and then the dude just bursts out of his own skin or something and it's just like ha 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 and they all run away it was real good it was real funny but it was also like oh my gosh like it was 
I didn't know what most of the others were. I mean, it was kind of like, oh, ha, ha goblins. And then the rest, I was like, what is happening? Wait, what uh, I, I was also reading it so quickly the first time that I thought Laird had showed up again because there's this sentence where um, Blake is realizing that he shouldn't leave the house. Um, and it says, like, Laird had come up to the front door. And it, my mind was like, when did Laird come up to the front door? <laughs> but it was him, like, logicking out the fact that people could get up to the door um, and that they were trying to fuck with him. Yeah. So in a shocking twist, Rose is encouraging Blake to act impulsively. And Blake decides to not act impulsively and to think about it, um, taking possession of the one brain cell that they both share. And... Um, <laughs> <laughs> decides to not do the thing on impulse. Good job, Blake. Uh, yeah, that was kind of that was kind of a shocking reversal, right? <laughs> like, yeah, and I and Blake does not get credit for that. I mean, like Rose is kind of like, oh, but you you knew it was you know it wasn't real, or you knew he wasn't human, or whatever, right? And like he didn't, but. Blake or Rose calls him out for like bad instincts and stuff later. And like nobody gives Blake credit for, or like no one in the text. The text has not yet given Blake credit for this moment of mm -hmm. thinking this through. And like, good job, yeah. Blake. So like, you didn't honestly, die. even if they were human, what was he going to do that wasn't also get impaled? You know, throw salt. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how much salt that house has, but I feel like. Rose said there was a lot, but I mean, yeah. It uh, well, it, I mean, no. who knows? Maybe they had enough to just... Uh, uh, Probably not. <laughs> no. Probably. Why has no one drawn a salt circle around themselves yet? Like we were in Hocus Pocus. Anyway, that should happen. Because obviously these protagonists haven't watched that brilliant film. And even though they talk about salt, um, I mean, they're also inside. So you probably don't really need to do that. <laughs> right. I just meant like pale or anything. No one's done that yet. Oh, I, don't think. I don't know. I mean... Keep an eye out, you know? <laughs> yes. Get ready for the salt, salt circles. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so definitely uh, horrifying. And I know this is past April Fool's Day. Thank goodness. <laughs> but, like, never prank someone like this. Like, <laughs> it, don't, don't do it. I mean, I don't know how you would do it unless you're, like, a visual effects or, like, makeup artist or anything. But, like, just... Or it's... In Arrested Development, how the, the dad would hire his, like, old worker or friend or whatever who had, like, lost an arm in the war or whatever to, like, constantly make <laughs> them think that they were doing things that was causing this man to lose his arm. <laughs> you shouldn't do that. Yeah, that's, that's, I mean, that's a funny premise for a show, but don't do that in real life. Okay, guys. All right. Glad that we went to cover that. Um <laughs> Yeah, so then Blake decides to call the pizza place back one more time just to make sure that, like, they're really not coming. Because now he's like, okay, I know that was a joke, but I don't really know if they're not going to actually do that. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, Yeah, and then this dude knows who Blake is. He doesn't, they don't have caller ID, right? He doesn't immediately pick up and say, like, fuck you. It's like Blake says hi, and then he says, fuck you. Like, this man knows the sound of Blake's voice. <laughs> Which is real intense. And also, why did he take his order in the first place? Maybe it was if a new guy. If he hates him this much. I, yeah. Uh. Also, it was funny because, like, Blake thought it was funny that they called um, Hills Lighthouse a haunted house because he was like, this might be the least haunted locale in Jacob's Bell. And I was like, there's a demon in your head. <laughs> <laughs> On my second read through. But there's only and it was one very funny. <laughs> okay. All the other weird stuff is outside. Uh. <laughs> um and it was it was a lot this was very aggressive this th their karma is bad like this isn't yeah. even like kennett where there's like carmine aggressive energy everywhere this man just like fucking hates these people yeah, yeah. i mean it, it kind of like at your time earlier like you know hope that they don't go to the demons for power and stuff but i mean you could kind of see how the, like family has gotten roped into this over time like whoever first decided to do this really fucked everybody over they suck yeah right because it's like yeah well how the hell else are you supposed to you know like get anything done <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i mean you could do the like get a shitty familiar and and then a okay implement and then a huge domain or whatever like blake's plan True, but if you already, well, I mean, we don't know how much 
how many generations exactly this is like come from True. but like yeah. um depending on how much bad karma the second guy had after the first guy <laughs> still might have had a lot of people trying to go after him and stuff so still needed to protect themselves in some way you know i mean plus if they were being raised by the dude that like is calling demons down they might not quite have that like moral fiber there to really mm -hmm. be like or that moral compass to be like maybe i shouldn't do this be like yeah dad's doing it why not you know or mom's doing it maybe more likely uh, i don't know like, yeah mom mom's doing it for yeah. some reason i'm curious about that anyway Moving on to the next part, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, they basically go back to the practitioner room, we'll say, and start to prepare for the awakening ritual. Blake sees the creepy demon book and wants to take a look. And Rose talks him out of looking, because saying that, like, they need to compromise on stuff. And she compromised earlier for something. Um, so he's like... <laughs> Supposedly. Yes. Can't remember what it was. But then he's like, all right, fine. Goes and puts the book back. And just coincidentally, really ominous note and the key attached to it falls out of the book. Blake looks at it without having any discussion whatsoever, goes and runs up to check out the power demon. <laughs> yeah, so the brain cell went back to Rose. It like whoop. <laughs> um, it's like Pong. It goes yeah. back and forth. <laughs> yeah. I also I just like why this book? She had a lot of books that were, like, demon-related, and I just, like, I mean, I guess I don't know what, like, diabolatry means. I mean, I just Googled it, and it's, like, the art of worshipping demons, and I was like, that's great. But I, like, wouldn't, that wouldn't have been the one I picked, and, like, does Blake know what that means? Um, or was it, like, I don't know, fate or something? Because, like, I would have maybe picked the one that describes some of the demons instead, like, the one they have, they read later to learn about Barbatorum. Well, I mean, you said it's, what was the definition exactly? Like, the art of worshipping demons? Is that what it was? Okay, no. It's the acts or rites of worshipping devils. Okay. I mean, like, that probably is your most, like, general guide. <laughs> as weird as a way to put that is. Um, to demon yeah. stuff. So maybe they're like, this is probably, like, your general thing in one book as opposed to reading, like, however many other books there were. Sure, it just didn't strike me as obvious that that's what that was. Like, mm, I fair. I mean, I don't know all the words. And, like, Blake might know this word, but I didn't know this word. Uh, and would have maybe picked up one of the other ones. Um, I also thought it was interesting that, like, it, it seems like Molly didn't find this. And so I'm wondering, like, how desperate she got or she just really didn't want to do the demon stuff. Like, I guess Molly kind of knew our family's involved with demons <laughs> and don't do it or something. Yeah. Like, and it's also funny that the note starts off with like, you must be really desperate right now. And it's like, no, grandma, it's day two. Like, like, just, like, grab this book. <laughs> like grandma's like, my grandchildren aren't going to want to fuck with this. And Blake's like, I mean, I don't. But I like, I, I think Blake's right. Like, you should know what is out there and you should know what you're dealing with and you should know what the others are expecting of you. Yeah. Um, yeah, for sure. But, <laughs> but I mean, I feel like Rose's point there wasn't like. I, I don't know. I'm just like, if you're not going to read anything, maybe don't just look at the really creepy note and, like, <laughs> nothing else before you run up to, like, look at the demon, right? Yeah. I mean, that's what, well, obviously Blake didn't come to that conclusion, but I feel like everyone else probably would have. But as you said, like, the brain cell wasn't pinged Ooh. back yet, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like... I feel like the, like... It pings back and forth in a steady clip, and just depending on. <laughs> I mean, I feel like they're not that stupid. Just, just to throw that out there, it's not quite one brain cell, but like, I feel like. You know. but, I just, I think that's a meme or something. Um, oh, is it really? Yeah, it I is, thought you just made I, that up, and I was like, that's hilarious. But no. All right. So, but yeah. So basically, he sprints up before she can say anything, because. Should we go through what the letter said? I mean, yeah, it's basically like, you must be in dire straits, like, if you're coming to this part of the book right now. Mm -hmm. It was interesting that, like, Grandma Rose is, like, once bound, he's going to fucking be there. Like, he, she's like, he's gonna be there, don't worry about it. And, like, yeah. but at the end of this chapter, I was kind of like, oh, fuck, like... Like, he's not there, but Is he? Yeah, yeah like, I, I kind of freaked out. 
And then, so thank you for allowing me to keep reading because, ugh, that would have been horrible. Yeah. The other two things I wanted to point out from the letter that I thought were interesting was like Barbatorum and his, like, don't ever thank him, don't ever acknowledge whatever. Yeah. Reminded me of the brownies. Right. And I just thought that that was a really interesting, I was like, are brownies devils? Like, what? what? <laughs> Maybe a little. Um, I Because I think the brownies were more like Fae. But then at some point, I think in the next chapter in the other book, she is like some demons are also maybe goblins. And so like the lines are blurring already between like demons and maybe some fae and maybe some goblins. And like that was really interesting. Mm -hmm. And then the second thing was that she says, like, don't ask the lawyer about this (laughs) because the lawyer and his firm are quite naturally unreliable on this front. And I'm like, ooh, 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 <laughs> because they're karmic law practitioners and they like order and they don't like demons. Okay. All right. Maybe. Okay. Cool. <laughs> we also still haven't met the fucking lawyer and someone should sue anyway. I mean, I feel like I'm not really spoiling anything by saying you're probably going to meet the lawyer at some point, just by how, how much they've <laughs> been mentioned. So, um, let me see. So do not trust Mr. Beasley or his firm persistence. They are quite naturally unreliable on this front. Okay. So just like, just because you think like they're so kind of opposite of the nature to a demon well, or in one of those textbooks I read, they talked about karmic law. Like if you, if you have a karmic law other as your practitioner, uh-huh. um, no, sorry. If you have a karmic law other as your familiar it could okay. alienate some like chaotic others because okay, sure. karmic law others are so orderly. So I think that maybe demons aren't, except they do have a lot of rules. I feel like they're maybe a little bit better together than they think, but it just seems like, I don't know. I'm looking for, I'm still looking for you. Also, karmic law. You're like, out there. It could just be like, you need orderly rules to deal with them. Not necessarily that they mm-hmm. are orderly, but Mm-hmm. interesting i like it so yeah he just runs up without saying anything and sees like a pair of shears that have impaled a line in the innermost circle of the diagram on the floor and so he's like well fuck i guess i'm gonna leave <laughs> now rose gets really fucking pissed yeah he survives um rose gets really pissed and she's about <laughs> um for being too impulsive while blake defends himself by citing his instincts on the street so this is like the first time he kind of is like, hey, I have almost died in periods where like before I met you and I've been through a lot of shit. So mm-hmm. I've got instincts where then she hilariously and bitchily is like, I don't think your instincts are very good. Um, but and he's like, well, they weren't at first, but they got good. So I don't know. That's kind of interesting. What did you think? Yeah. Well, before... Um, I talk about the instincts. I thought it was so 1.7. The first line is damn it. And it's italicized and it's like one line. And I like rereading the second time. I was like, oh, my gosh, because like I had been thinking so hard that first chapter about what damn me, damn them, damn them all means. Um, <laughs> and I was just like, gosh, darn, like, what is like, what what is this? Like, there must be something. And like. Now it's like, oh, it's damn because there's demons and that's the whole thing. <laughs> um, so I figured it out. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> that's demons. Yeah. Um, demons. That is funny. Um, yeah, I, I was really excited to get into Blake's backstory more. I was like, I'm not sure if we're going to learn more. I think we might because like this book's going to get worse and maybe he'll open up more okay um, yeah but i was like proud of him and ex- and i was like this is like good this is information rose needs to know to like treat you better and yeah. also like talk to you in a way that is informed by your trauma or whatever i'm also like yeah i don't think your instincts are that good i'm trying to figure out if i agree because like it seems like throughout this story blake has figured a lot of things out he figured out about the bird antler others and like what they wanted and that they didn't want to make it look like they had killed him. Um, he managed to get away. Uh, he managed to get to the rest stop, but then he also like, he goes with Laird 
which wasn't the best idea. Yeah, um, that was the best, but... But it was okay. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it ended up okay, because of Rose, yeah. essentially, but... Yeah, yeah. You know. And then he does not go out of the house to help that pizza delivery man, which was a the right choice. Yeah, that was the But right then he choice. runs up to see if this demon is there, and then doesn't have, like, the ability to like accurately assess whether the demon is there in the first place so like that was just like dumb and a waste of time um <laughs> but also a really great cliffhanger so it was worth it true um yeah i did think that the part where he was kind of talking to her um arose and he was saying that like he thought or what did you think about this like when he was said that the demon might have killed molly yeah um so this actually didn't make it into a cut of a past episode of ours because Jen's recording equipment freaked out. My um, bad, guys. It, no, it's fine. So we just had, we had to record some, like we had to talk about some stuff twice and I, I don't think this made it. But Jen asked me what I thought about a demon killing Molly. And I immediately was just like, no, because if Laird thought that the demon <laughs> had killed Molly, then like that would have been a different conversation. It would have been like, hey, um your fucking demon is loose? Like, what the fuck? Like, it wouldn't have been like, oh, I don't know. Yeah. Like, they're never going to catch the culprit because it would have been like, a fucking demon? Like, <laughs> your demon is loose? Like, what's going on? Because, like, the, the demon wasn't, Molly wasn't found, like, dead in the house or whatever. She's found, you know, outside or whatever. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it yeah. also would have been worse, which is really horrifying to say. I feel like rereading that, I was kind of like, yeah, and I'm like, that's kind of weak. I mean, <laughs> even though he like he was like I felt more confident as I was saying this I was like eh I mean I don't know and also if that is what killed Molly isn't that even more reason to do more reading on it before you run up there um, right but. but then also like if it got if it killed Molly like wouldn't it have left like why would it still yeah. be there or wouldn't you be dead already yeah because if the demon's out of the circle like a door's not going to stop it, right? Yeah, you're gonna be f- it can get into domain. It can get into domain. I just, I don't know. Yes. I don't, I don't. Mm, mm, mm. It's gonna be major F. <sighs> yeah. Fortunately, <laughs> the demon has not escaped, as they find yeah. out. <laughs> oh. um, they basically start doing what they should have done, which is. <laughs> Yeah, reading. so they, they, they do the reading on Barbatorum that Blake definitely should have done before running upstairs. Let's kind of go through this a little bit here. So yeah, Rose is writing, basically, and talking about how this is, like, her first major thing as a practitioner that she's, like, really proud of. Um, in terms of, like, she has got this demon. She's mm-hmm. bound this guy. And then she goes mm-hmm. through, like... Uh, it kind of talks about, like, what they think Barbatorum is. So it falls under the classification Insolidus Nex. I probably butchered the hell out of that. but Nobody knows what that means. I didn't even Google it. I'm, I'm sure mean, it's like fake I'm Latin sure, or real Latin or something. I'm it's sure some real Latin. people know what it means. I'm pretty sure Waldo <laughs> knows what it means. We don't. Yeah. We've got that brain cell <laughs> going back and forth. It just hasn't clicked in yet. So, um, so she's saying... She doesn't believe in stricter classifications and leaves it to others to label him a devil or goblin as they see fit. So I was really interested to hear what you thought about that. I think it's really interesting that from the very from the very get go of this book, people are like, don't put others in boxes. Like, how dare you? <laughs> like, and like, if this man is a goblin, that's so fucking horrifying. Like goblins. I didn't think goblins could get this like powerful um i mean it's really interesting that like maybe there's like a like you know like the lines are blurred and you can kind of move back and forth or whatever but like what okay yeah because i know we we, in pale like in pale we've seen we've seen a lot of goblins (laughs) i mean and they're saying that you could label him a devil or a goblin as they see fit i guess so not necessarily saying he's definitely a goblin but did that blow your mind to think that that like some people could think of Barbatorum as a goblin potentially, or are you just like just because he's dirty and gross doesn't mean that he's a goblin? You guys are being dumb, or like? I mean, I, I just I kind of think that I don't know enough, and it was scary. Like the description of what this 
guy can do does not match my understanding of what goblins are are and can do. Okay. We have gotten some bad descriptions for certain things in Pale, though. Like, Toad Swallow saying that he was kind of, he did some pretty bad things to a child of a practitioner, but, like, I think it's because he got, like, trapped into it or something. I'm trying to remember exactly. Well, it's also, like, Blunt Munch goes out and, like, makes dogs war or dogs of whatever. Yeah. I just, that's just not this level. Like, yeah. <laughs> of fair. either, like, power or ruthlessness yeah like goblins from what i've experienced are like it's like the children outside who are like laughing and like impaling people's hands on shit and like b- jumping up and scaring people and like you know have like nails through their stomach and shit um yeah. which is a lot but yeah and so like again i could see that maybe this is like on the goblin-y side of demons or something like that okay that yeah there probably aren't great categorizations probably aren't perfect in many ways yeah um but this doesn't seem like a goblin like a straight up goblin yeah that's no. fair. okay i mean so she basically talks about how she bound him which is interesting because it's like talking about like some things that seem kind of technical like an abstract <laughs> entity bound in a room defining diagram of geometric lines in byzantine notation Use the Tiberi's approach. Uh, <laughs> she's like, so that's what she used exactly. So, a pile of festering boar carcasses, six feet high, each carved with his name, went well into their state of decay. Seven jars of burning hair, resupplied to keep the flames perpetually alight. Which I gotta say, like, hair burns kind of fast, doesn't it? Yeah, whose hair is this? <laughs> yeah, whose hair is this? How the hell did you keep it resupplied? that well they must have been big ass jars or like really compact hair something um anyway and the crest of this offering was an innocent <laughs> and a virgin in the form of a one-year-old innocent placed at the height of the pile this author can't say whether he was attracted <laughs> to the virgin aspect or the innocent but this author was nonetheless happy to have an option at hand to serve both purposes the child was unharmed and largely unaware of what occurred I mean, I have a two-year-old, and he can be a pain in the butt sometimes, but <laughs> there's no way I would ever, like... Uh, sacrifice I, I mean, him to a demon? Oh, but she wasn't trying to sacrifice. It was, the, the child was unharmed. It's yeah, fine. I just... So I'm starting, to, I'm, starting, I'm starting to get it, y'all. It's really... it's It's been a while. I needed some concrete examples, but I'm really starting to understand how demons can fuck with your car. <laughs> <laughs> she put her child on top of a stack of festering boar carcasses yeah, as I, bait for a demon and she hadn't ever done it before and so she didn't know it was gonna be okay like yeah. what the fuck I mean I do yeah she's a psychopath I still respect her but she's a psychopath I mean straight up I do just want to say I recognize I haven't been the most impartial for certain things like that <laughs> so i'm sorry but i let my knowledge of this get in the way but now you know <laughs> i get it. get it i mean you didn't pay attention to me anyway so it's fine I didn't ruin anything, but um true <laughs> true well, i just <laughs> also it makes me i keep thinking about like why she didn't awaken her children or why she didn't yeah uh, uh-huh. or pass the house to her kids or whatever uh-huh. and like maybe part of it is that she thinks her kids suck and maybe they've been like co- corrupted by demon energy or whatever because also like mm-hmm. she couldn't write down that the child was unaware because that would have been a lie so she had to write down that it was mostly unaware which means the kid kind of understood that, that something was happening which is horrifying anyway um but was it also like she wanted to use them for bait she was like i can't awaken them because then they won't be bait like, I bet she had really strict rules about sex in her house so that she could be like, well, here's another virgin. Um, <laughs> that, I never, that never occurred. That's, that's hilarious. Like, I mean, they might have been too old by that point where they would have, like, noticed, but. But, I mean, hey, but if they just needed a virgin, then it's fine. <laughs> be like, all right, I know you haven't, like, yeah. Oh, man, that's funny. Um, Okay, but anyway, she's like, well, 
even though I wrote down this great method, don't use this again <laughs> because he's going to remember it. Okay. So eh. don't get a one year old little kid to put on a bunch of rotting boar carcasses. Okay. I like, just don't It'll do work. it. Oh. Gotta use a different animal. <laughs> Maybe a different type of child, you know, <laughs> different age. Jeez. Oh, but yeah, she's like, this is the proudest accomplishment at this particular date and time. And then the, you know, Rose and Blake are understandably like, wow, like, can't understand why Uncle Charles or Aunt Irene are kind of fucked up in the head. Kind of get mm-hmm. that. Let me see. So that they talk about a little bit more backstory on the Barbatorum. So who's Uncle Charles? Is that Blake's dad? Because his name was not Charles, right? Uh, I mean, it was like Paul or some shit. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway, I mean, it's, it's, I here. <laughs> it's fine. It's hard to keep track of this family. They're just there's a lot of them. Okay. Yeah. I know we're probably. I mean, I know we're doing a podcast about the book, so you might think you guys need to pay attention to stuff like this, but, you know, don't worry about it. It's hard. <laughs> it's hard. We only got one brain cell bouncing back and forth, okay? Ping, so ping, rough. ping. <laughs> um, anyway, so kind of talks about barbers. Um, in addition to cutting hair, used to be surgeons as well. Right on a barber pole is reference to bloodletting, which I feel like I have heard that before, even before I read this, mm-hmm. um, which mm-hmm. is very creepy, mm-hmm. but cool. <laughs> um, he can give boons, but... That's it's, nice. It's, but <laughs> he serves as a better, like, better to send against an enemy than to give you boons. Um, yeah, because he can just get into your fucking domain like it's no problem. Like, it's nuts. He can remove any ability a practitioner has. What the fuck does that mean? Can he remove my ability to, like, walk? Can he remove my ability to, like... I mean, to, he like, does have, like, a... Enjoy big... cilantro? Like, what the fuck? <laughs> I mean, he could... I mean, he could definitely remove your ability to walk. Okay, yeah, but... <laughs> <laughs> without cutting me into little pieces or whatever. Oh, well, you didn't specify that, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so it's like he tries to do the maximum damage possible without killing them, but he also can heal you up. He okay. will he- heal the crud out of you, keep you alive, and most of the times, you die from starvation or dehydration, as opposed to blood It's like loss. crucifixion. Yay. I think. Yeah, not a good okay. way to go. No. Nope. Um, also says you can sever his target's ability to access any higher plane forever and irrevocably denying them whatever good things might await them after death, which is terrifying. Hey, there's <laughs> there's, there's an afterlife. That's nice. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> uh, but you don't get there anymore, so <laughs> I cut it off. Um, uh. Several forms that he has had before include a bipedal sheep largely bald but has some sparse patches um a bloated man disfigured to a monstrous point by lash wounds a pair of children hand in hand of course there's children in there gotta have the crazy kid somewhere and a legless man on a horse he always carries a bladed instrument of some kind has been known to carry scissors clippers or shears in more than half of the reported cases how does he stay on the horse I mean, the horse is a part of him, right? Because it's. But if he doesn't have legs, well, he takes the form of a man, a legless man on a horse. Sure. So it's, it's not just a legless man who finds a horse somewhere, right? Sure. I mean, I don't know. He probably stabs like is stabbed through into the horse or something. Because yeah, slavery. okay, okay, okay. Yeah, awful. Yeah. Um, he is mute. So some of these lovely boons that he lists as well. Let's see which one of these you would like. Maybe this can be our discussion question. Which one of these would you take? <laughs> um, he can offer an expert skill in medicine ex- in exchange for enough blood to make the practitioner pass out. Just don't spill mm-hmm. any on the circle. He will offer <laughs> to extend a practitioner's natural lifespan by half or by 25 years, whichever is less. At the cost- Grandma! Sorry, keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> at the cost of the practitioner forever smelling blood rot and or burning hair wait <laughs> i was can i can we stop and talk about yeah. this yeah okay um 
That's why Grandma Rose's study smells like roses because she's trying to get away from the rotting blood smell because she has made this deal with this man, um, demon man, uh, like Laird sort of insinuated, although that like hurts my Laird and Grandma are romantically involved theory, but it's okay. <laughs> I mean, she can't, she wasn't that old, was she? But Laird talks about how she had a long time and like stuff. Like I kind of talked about this last week that maybe Laird like was helping her out. True. It seems like she did extend her life somehow, or like she got more time somehow. Okay. Well, uh, all right, we'll keep that in mind. That's a good theory. All right. <laughs> the constellation I should have saved guy. that for my bold prediction anyway. We can we can go over it again. That's fine. Um, we'll go over them again at the end just to make sure we remember. And he can also ensure that one's blade's never dull in exchange for enough of the practitioner's blade skin to fill two cupped hands. See, that's just not worth it at all. Literally buy a sharpening stick thingy. Get yourself someone who likes doing that. Like, literally, that's not worth it. The first one I can like, okay, cool. You can be like a master doctor and save people's lives for like, you know, donating a shit ton of blood. Cool. Once you wake up, slash have someone there. To yeah, wake have you someone up. there. Don't be And a- then. <laughs> you need to have um, someone. Yeah, you could sorry. save your own self. Uh, but but blood blood comes back, you know. Don't fucking flay your own skin to keep your knife sharp. That's stupid. That's really dumb. That's dumb as hell. Um, yeah, that I mean, one's who, dumb. Maybe there, you might have a good reason. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I guess they didn't specify who's cupped hands. So if you're gonna be like Grandma Rose and bring your little one year old in anyway, just get them to <sighs> fill like hold their little cupped hands out, and then there you go. Cute. Yeah, it didn't specify. <laughs> So, anyway. <laughs> but would you um, trust your child to not go near that circle? Oh, fuck no. <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah. So I love not. my son. He would, like, I mean, he, yeah, he's he's wonderful. And he is really smart in a lot of ways. But he has so much damn energy. He, mm-hmm. like, he would be sprinting into that circle. <laughs> he would be, he'd be in there. It'd be bad. So, yeah, no, Mika's, I mean, I was going to say Mika's going to stay away from demons, but, I mean, obviously, <laughs> I think, like, yeah, that doesn't really have to be said. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to stay away from demons. We're going to keep everyone away from, let's just not go near, near demons, okay? All yeah, right. It's dumb. Good talk, guys. Um, <laughs> anyway. I also don't fully understand his whole contracts thing. You can show him if you show him a contract seven times, he's just like, fuck this. But it's like, is it just that like if you keep bothering him with the same contract, he's going to be like, stop talking to me? Or is it like you can only show him seven contracts? Like ever? Ever. Um, Because that seems like a problem. I feel like I, I mean, I don't know. It's fine. If it's important, we'll learn. It means I would, later. You know, I was going to say probably any contract, but on the other hand, you think Grandma Rose would mention how many times she's needed to contract him, if that were the case. Mm-hmm. So maybe it is just a single contract. I don't mm-hmm. know. I feel like either way, that kind of would have been good info to pass on mm-hmm. that <laughs> little emergency <laughs> note. But mm-hmm. I mean, she probably is also like, I mean, don't be an idiot and be trying to ask for a contract for him seven times anyway because yeah anyway Mm -hmm. and then um before i move on i was gonna say uh she describes this man whose name has escaped me for a moment barba barbaro barbatorum she describes barbatorum as a reasonably safe entity to summon if one takes care to follow instructions i'm trying to see if my prediction that it was a weak demon that wasn't going to burn the house down <laughs> is fulfilled by this. Okay. Um, Cause it's not going to burn the house down. I don't think he has fire powers and he's a reasonably safe and he's not going to get out. <laughs> reasonably safe. Doesn't necessarily mean weak though. Right. Right. This man does not sound weak, uh, but like also I'm like, I mean, and this is, this is the first demon we're being introduced to. True. So it's like setting expectations and, and setting the scale. But I also think that like, this is not, the scariest or strongest thing we're going to encounter, which is like a lot to deal with emotionally as I think about the next three years of my life and this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, I mean, you never know. This might be the worst one. I mean, if he's like, if he gets out and then the whole rest of the story is just trying to get him back. Get but him like, back. yeah, no, he doesn't even do fire. He's not the worst one. Like, what's a demon without fire? It's a goblin. It's not that exciting. <laughs> Are you saying he's a goblin? Then? No. <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, well, we will see as we go on. <laughs> just, yeah. Buckle up. No. <laughs> yeah. Let me know how I should mark that prediction on the sheet. I haven't decided. Well, I mean, I'm not going <laughs> to tell you. I'm not going to tell you. You're, you're gonna have to, we're going to have to keep going on until we get enough info for you to know. Okay. I'm not going to mark it like, it was totally right, or it was totally wrong. No. Well, he's not going to burn the house down. Whatever. I might put a question mark. Put anyway, a question mark, okay. or put, like, maybe. I don't know. Maybe. Like, but I'm not going to tell you. You got to mark okay. it off. All right. So, should we move on to the awakening? Let's do it. Awesome. So, they awaken, kind of. Rose's awakening... Kind of debatable if that's work or not. She doesn't really seem convinced that it has. Blake's totally has, and he sees these cool moat things in the site. But, um, so we've kind of tried to go through the awakening ritual in comparison to Pact and Pale. So, Pact's diagram and Pale's diagram are different, like just on their face, like even before we get to all the items, right? Which seemed mostly similar. But Pact has a circle with five circles in the middle and then a circle with six circles. Sorry. Okay. In the innermost circle is a circle with five circles. And then there's a circle with six circles. And then on the outside, there's a circle with seven circles. Whereas in Pale, there is a circle with seven circles in the middle or like in the very inside. <laughs> middle is such a bad word. In the inside that has a triangle in it that the Kenneteers stand in. And then there's a circle with five circles. And then the outermost circle also has five circles. Right. And it's like double walled. Mm -hmm. I am assuming to like let the others in and out, which was kind of cool. So the packed innermost circle is for the gifts from the others, which include crystal, myrrh, oil, spice, and Rose uses holly and Blake uses iron. Then outside of that is the six circle circle that I think has the pillars of humanity. The problem is we have seven items that should fit into this middle circle, but there's only six circles. So the, those are the dagger, the hourglass, the dream catcher, the skull, the coin, the rose, and then a personal object, right? Mm -hmm. And then the outermost circle is the gifts to the others, but there's only six gifts to the others. Um, so we're thinking maybe like something got switched in our minds or in the descriptions or something, but the, the six gifts to the others are molasses, milk, vegetable ash, honey, meat, and alcohol. So unlike in Pale, um, there's no bread as a gift to the other, which was interesting. And I don't know what that means. Uh, so I was confused as to like where the rows slash keys were placed. Also, does Blake melt down the iron? That I don't that was just a lot. Um Yeah, so then so then Pale, it's the inner is the gifts to the others because they they hand them them as they show up. And then the middle is the gifts from the others. And the outside is the pillars of human experience, right? Because they and there's no rose, which I'm assuming has to do with like the Thorburns and Rose and crap. And then they're holding on to their personal I items. Okay. I'm really curious to see what the community thought about Pale's awakening ritual when it happened. And someday I will be able to go and look at all those lovely um, things where you guys freak out about it because they seem like fairly similar, but also different, you know? So, or do you mind if I interject? Please. Or, okay. So partially looking on the wiki and partially just like from my read and stuff, I don't think that those were like the, the part you're saying gifts from the others. I don't think those are necessarily gifts from the others. I think that they were supposed to be items representing like the elements. Right. So it says in the wiki, in the Thorburn version, these items went in the center ring and then candles were placed around the outside, and then needed to be lit, iron or heated. And then in the Kennet version, these items were not in place before the ritual began. 
with them instead being placed in the outer ring by attending others. That might be why you thought they were gifts from the others. Um, but I don't think they were intended to be gifts from the others. Okay. Yeah, I thought it was like some sort of symbolic, like, we're giving you this and you're giving us that thing that just in pact is just like, there aren't others there. So they're just mm. the spirits or whatever. I think I think maybe it is more symbolic and pale like that. But uh, yeah, in pact. I mean, especially like those who, like me, who read pact for the first time, we definitely, or at least I wasn't reading that and being like, oh yeah, this is definitely another gift. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, no, yeah. I was approaching it. Yeah, okay. That's yeah. fair. Yeah, that's fair, though. I can see where you got that from. Yeah, so, but I mean, everything else, I feel like I feel like your observations are pretty spot on. Um, yeah, so one thing that was kind of interesting, right, um, like in, in Pale, they had Holly, right? Um, yeah, well, they, they also, they got a choice um, that Miss, I think, or Matthew asked which one they wanted, um, and Miss explained that the, the Holly was traditional and, like, rooted, and the iron was, like, forward looking to the future kind of a thing um because holly was the traditional one that you would use uh so like wood and then and we moved to the future it was like iron or metal and um, that's right okay so i was trying to use this to think about why their books told them to do different things and i still think that rose is a particular version of blake as a woman okay and it seems like she could have been chosen for specific things and I'm, I'm just that's really interesting and i don't know if it's like blake is all about moving and it's all about going forward and it's all about like moving beyond these things mm -hmm. but he is more rooted with like some good relationships both in his family and outside of them like he, he had molly and page you know whereas rose only has blake and maybe needs roots but also like is not is like maybe a little bit more like small C conservative. Like she seems a little bit more like unwilling to take risks, but then she also like, I don't know. I, I, that's what I maybe could think of. I thought it was interesting that they ended up doing different ones. Yeah. It was interesting that Blake had a choice. I wasn't sure if Rose also had a choice, but then like Molly, presumably her book said iron and she did iron and we just moved on. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious about that. Hmm. I don't know. Yeah, I guess keep it in mind, I guess, moving forward. Yeah, definitely interesting. I, I did like in Pale how they they got a choice um, and mm -hmm. kind of talked about, like, each one. I felt like that was pretty cool. So personal item. Yeah, keys for Blake's. Um, Joel's keys. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was kind of like, Joel needs his keys back. But... I liked the explanation about um, freedom and movement and he doesn't like owing people things and, and he likes like it, it just. It, it makes sense for him. Yeah. And like, I, I liked that it was, it was both like a connection to a friend, um, mm -hmm. but it was also like he, it was like in exchange for this thing that he had worked really hard to build and acquire for himself. Like it was like, it's his freedom, his independence, but also like a connection to other people. Um, I thought it was a really, neat item and i really freaking want to know what roses was right uh yeah i wonder what she could have grabbed randomly from throughout the house but i know i'm like trying to double check it i don't think yeah i don't think it mentioned anything so um, yeah because toward the end he even thinks like oh i didn't think to see what rose's personal item was and that's when like like it it all gets i'm like what the heck does she have i don't know i hope I kind of hope she didn't pick this, but like maybe like a small mirror or something. It's like very much her existence right now, but I hope that she would have picked something. She could uh, grab, like if she liked her pajamas she was wearing. <laughs> <you know? laughs> These pajamas represent <laughs> um, old life. Um, yeah. So you wrote in the notes here their decision to do it at the same time and not in the same diagram. Um, I guess I like, do you think they would have even thought of to do it in the same diagram? No. Well, when I was imagining this, I was thinking about the Kenneteers, like before this chapter, I was thinking about the Kenneteers and how they were all in the middle of the same diagram. Mm -hmm. And then as they were doing it the first time, I was kind of like, okay, that makes sense. Like, you know, that's where Rose physically is and this is where you physically are and stuff. But like, I kept kind of picturing them more as like immediately back to back because they were like, I think they were facing away from each other because they were naked or whatever. And I, I wonder if it would have been 
stronger or weaker or something if like he had brought the mirror physically into the center of the diagram or would that have like bisected it somehow like would it not have totally existed on rose's side and it's also like how does the mirror world work like she has water (laughs) but she also like if blake started drawing things on the ground or taking books off the shelves her books wouldn't fly off of her shelves and things wouldn't be drawn onto her ground and that's weird but also that's not totally true because she picks up the, the note off the desk and reads it. I don't know, man. She needs to get out of the mirror world. It's too confusing. It is confusing. Yeah, but I, I mean, I like that they did it at the same time. I felt like that like linked them more, but I also, they weren't in the same diagram. And maybe that's good. I don't know. I just. I guess I have a lot of things. They also did the ritual naked, unlike the mm-hmm. Kenneteers. They. Let's see, read a scripted thing in some language, as you wrote down. Like, with the Kenneteers, they sort of, like, ad-libbed in English, but here they were, like, reading a script, you know? And it was, like, they were trying, they were reading it in a language, they weren't reading it in English. True. Yeah, they they were both, like, pretty in sync with each other when they were speaking, mm-hmm. which is cool. I mean, it, it all, like, moved around, and it and then it was all gone at the end, which was, like, how it was with the other. Uh, Kenneteer's Awakening, which was really fun. Mm-hmm. Um, and I liked how when they were in sync, they were like saying what they thought the pillars or whatever like represented. And it's like a uh, war and time, but then they split. Um, and it was like Blake said dream and Rose said fate. Blake said doom and Rose said death. Blake said fortune and Rose said ruin. And then Blake said family for the Rose. And then Rose said myself. And I just, like, really like a lot about what, like, that says about them. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm not sure exactly about, like, the dream and fate. Maybe Blake is, like, more hopeful and Rose feels more trapped by what will happen to her. Uh, Doom and death was interesting. Uh, Reminded me of, like, Matthew, but also just, like, Mm -hmm. maybe there are things worse than death. Or or that felt more like a, like, Doom feels more like fate. Like, this, like, the grim. Yeah. the (laughs) The grim. And Um, then Blake's like, oh, money, I need that when I was homeless. And Rose is like, oh, my fucking family tore itself apart because of this house. Um, True. And Blake still has connections to his family, whereas Rose, like, doesn't. uh, I don't know. It was interesting. Rose has definitely got the more, I guess, pessimistic. Bummer. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, they both, you can kind of see, like, they both have points. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um. It's like, I'm doing this for me and Rose, which is sweet. I thought that was really sweet and really empowering. And I like, I mean, this girl's been in his life for two days, but like, it, it's already like, yeah, it's Blake and Rose kind of like against everything else. Like, it's not just like, oh, I'm doing this for me and like, whatever to that girl. Like, I just like, I liked that he was acknowledging a commitment to his family and like, I don't want other people to have to go through this. And like, I don't want my other cousins to have to like experience this and like, but also like I'm doing this for me and I'm doing this for Rose. And I really like that. And I was like the, the worst thing about the, them doing this at the same time was I didn't get to hear what Rose said. I thought it would be like, they would take turns like with the awakening ritual with pale. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, what did she say? (laughs) What was her object? (sighs) Just to ask. um, So he woke up. What did you think of Blake's sight? I don't, I don't get it. (laughs) I mean, with the Ken of Tears, it was like, there's fleshy, like, saran wrap men, and there's knives everywhere, and I'm seeing, like, lines and connections and handprints, and I know that a lot of that is, like, the Carmine Beast is dead, and they're seeing, like, the ramifications of that, whereas, like, this is just, like, a more chill space, but, like, little tiny moat thingies that dance around, I, uh, I don't, I don't know what to do with that. His tattoo was moving. That was cool. Right? It was artsy. He's the tattoo whisperer. He's like Maui in Moana. He's going to yes. just like have tattoos that bounce around him all the time. Uh, and like colors were a bit brighter. Things were a bit shinier. Uh, maybe he can like see things that have like more significance to people or something. Like his mm. his tattoos probably have a lot of significance to him. And some of the books on the shelves maybe were really significant to grandma or something. Uh, okay. That's my best guess. That'd be pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Right. I know. Poor Rose. She basically is <laughs> like, 
Nothing happened. I might have just lost my ability to lie for nothing. And just like, I'm not offering anything worth taking. And the spirits, there aren't any spirits here to listen and obey. That was so depressing. I know. <laughs> Poor Rose. I, I believe that there's going to be a solution. But I don't know what it is. Other than getting out of the mirror. Yeah, he gives the Rose a little bit of alone time. And then he decides to, why not go relax in the tower with the tower demon again? Um, he goes and takes a look. Um, sees Barbatorum crawling out of the shears. Um, so he's described as a brown skinned man, his pale hair scraggly and long, inconsistent here and there, warm baldness in hair. He was old, wizened, hopefully I'm saying that word right, I feel like I never say that out loud, um, with a pot belly and spots all over his skin. So yeah. That's nice ominous note nice, to end the chapter. Right? Very nice ominous note to end. I guess we'll go over real quick, like, kind of saving this till this part. Um, obviously had quite a few things to compare to Hale in these chapters, um, especially The Awakening. We already compared that quite a bit. So we're going to go over the others in the pizza party section. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as I was reading, um, this is kind of a more humorous comparison, but the I think the first other that's like described more in depth is like, a little boy who like is bleeding everywhere and like scratching at his like own head. And there's like blood everywhere. Who's like likely maybe a goblin. Um, but I was also kind of like, Ooh, like, is that a waif? Like the hungry choir, like, like of the alternate version. <laughs> and then the second other was like a woman who you couldn't see her face because it was obscured by her hat and like all this stuff. But then when you could sort of see her face, there was just like this dark smudge where her eyes and mouth was. And I was like, Oh, it's like dark twisted miss. And like, yeah. she's smoking a cigarette. And I was like, sick. And it was just like this funny thing where I was like, ha the gang's all here. Like the, the twisted weird gang is all here. I, upon first meeting the Ken and others um, in pale, I remember that you asked me like, Oh, like, like you were kind of excited. You were like, what do you think of them? Like, and I was like, I don't know. They're all scary and creepy. Like what? Like, like <laughs> there's a goblin who like pulled poop out of his pants. And then there's like the like scary gross girl in the trees. And then there's like the like scary moth lady and like the big giant. And then like the like buzz cut dude. Like I was, and like, and then like the depressed people, I was like, none of this is great or fun in any way. <laughs> and then, you know, two arcs later, I'm just like, yeah, I love them all. Like, <laughs> And so um, that was sort of a similarity where I was kind of like, except this one, I was like, huh, they're more fun because <laughs> I <laughs> goblins are fun, even though I wouldn't want to interact with them in real life. And this seemed more love like a ha ha ha. Like, I think they think that this was funny. So are you trying to say you're waiting for a couple chapters down the road when we start to suddenly love all these others? And the fluff demons. And the fluff demons. I mean, that's coming. Yes, without saying. I think that the other others are like antagonists. You know, they're like not on Blake and Rose's side. So um, I'm not sure that they're going to get as fun as the Kedit others. Mm -hmm. um, but I think coming from Pale, I'm more sympathetic and also just kind of more like I can better imagine what they're experiencing, maybe. Do you feel like you can understand why they're being so hostile? I mean, I think they're instructed to be. I guess I'm assuming that these are all bound others. I don't know if that's a dumb hmm. assumption. So you think these are being sent by like the by other practitioners. practitioners who are trying to get okay uh, them out of the house? Gotcha. Okay. So do you think yeah. if we run into any practice or any others that are unbound, like do you think that they're going to act differently? Well, I mean, the fairy, like, were scary, but weren't immediately like, I'm going to murder you on your own fence. <laughs> um, Fair. So it felt to me like they were, like, sent there to harass them and not like they were just sort of, like, happened to be in the neighborhood or whatever. Okay. All I right. think a lot of others are more afraid of practitioners and wouldn't. I mean, maybe they're like, these aren't even practitioners yet and they're babies. But I think mm -hmm. a lot of them wouldn't want to um, fuck with a practitioner if it could mean, like, eternal servitude or whatever. 
Like, I can't okay. imagine there are many yeah. others in Jacob's Bell who are just like, this is a great place to live. Like, <laughs> like this is great. I'm, I'm totally free and able to do whatever I want. <laughs> That's fair. Do you think that whether these are bound or not, do you think after, like, the, now that they've awakened, um, that that's going to be different, like in terms of others waiting outside their house to break them out, or you think it's probably going to be about the same? Or, um, I imagine that eventually it will change or go away, either because they'll get stronger or just like I feel like never being able to really leave the house is going to get old narratively. I think that initially it might not change because they're still like baby practitioners um, slash Blake is still a baby practitioner, but it might, uh, but it, it just, yeah, it seems like if there's constantly just like some fucking goblins outside of their house, like that's going to get old slash they, they can't be there to harass them for the three hours before and after the council meeting or whatever. Okay, um, I guess to ask, do you have a new Bolden specific prediction? Or do you want me, should we kind of go back to some of the Bolden specific predictions that you made? You said Johannes, his familiar, is, is a based, constellation. Is a constellation, <laughs> which is pretty cool, I think. All right, so I'd say that counts as a Bolden specific prediction. Yeah. All right. Was that then, one? And then grandma made a deal with Barbatorum to increase her lifespan, which is why she had roses everywhere because she smelled bad stuff all the time. I mean, I don't know if that would have worked that well or not, but <laughs> who knows? Maybe <laughs> roses and bad stuff is better than just bad stuff. Maybe. Yeah, that, that could be true. All right. Um, I guess if you think of a golden specific prediction later on that you want to add, we can edit it in. <laughs> but otherwise, those are two bold and specific predictions that we've got. <laughs> All right, on to our discussion question. Um, we asked, using Laird's international politics metaphor, describe the world of pale. So we had a couple good responses here. Um, we'll start with Captain Rhino. So basically, it was a long paragraph. You guys should go read it. <laughs> I guess it wasn't that long, but it's kind of long to tell it on this here, but basically they were kind of did this uh set this scene where they were explaining to Avery of Rona and Lucy with other verses like basically by using comparisons of the International Criminal Court and um the UN. Uh, it was pretty fun to read. <laughs> so go ahead and take a look at that if you're interested. Megafire seven talks about Roman history that I don't know anything about. They Ditto. compare <laughs> They compare the situation in Kennet if Bristow had gotten his wish to Asterix and Obelix's village, surrounded by the Roman Empire, only without the magic potion to turn the tide. This actually might not be like actual historical things, but I mean, I don't it know. Cool. Could be. <laughs> um, and then they also compare Crooked Rook to like a terrorist as opposed to like a nation, and um, because her like schemes seem mostly to be sabotaging the practitioners out of spite to try to eke out a more substantial win against the system. I thought that was an interesting and really apt comparison for Rook. That's true. Um, and then last but not least, we have Beard of Valor basically started out by saying, I reject politics as a metaphor <laughs> and instead I'll use roles in a functional town. He actually went through um, and did a really good um, analysis uh, basically Again, kind of long, so you guys should go and read it. But he compared Alexander to the mayor. Um, the trio are more like resilient grassroots campaign as opposed to opposition candidates. Said the goblin princesses are Eastern crime lords, which is just nice. great. Um, <laughs> uh, basically, and they, like Matthew, Matthew and Edith lead the local chamber of commerce and John to the sheriff's deputy because, of course, he needs to be the sheriff's deputy. And then within cabinet, the trios are the sheriffs. So a lot of good stuff there. Uh, so thank you guys for um, contributing and answering our question. Pre appreciate it. Yeah, it was very thorough and very fun. Mm hmm. 
As for our discussion question this week, we want to know, how would you summon Barbatorum? I'm just kidding. We actually really don't want to know that. <laughs> Please don't um, tell us. We really don't want to know that. Uh, <laughs> based on how that description was. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want to know, dude. Just like, yeah, leave your leave your little nieces and nephews alone or like whoever. <laughs> you know, it's fine. You don't need to summon that, dude. Um, our actual discussion question. Um, just like taking a look at the site um, that we saw how Blake's site was and how the kind of your site is a lot different. What do you think your site would look like if you were to awaken today? Probably not really any way to know this, especially since <laughs> this is a fictional story, but. Um, yeah, right. Thinking. Well, I was thinking about we get I don't know anything about Blake's site yet, but with um, Verona and Lucy and Avery, it seemed really tied to how they were in that moment. You know, Verona's like, I like the darkness and like she can see in the dark and it's all dark and stuff. And Lucy, you know, uses a knife and she sees knives everywhere. And Avery was like really desperate for and looking for connections. And that's kind of like what she sees. Mm -hmm. So kind of thinking like, where are you at? Like, what's up with you? (laughs) You will do some internal whatever and think about how that would manifest in the site. And maybe Jenny and I can also try to come up with something um, to share Uh, with y'all. I would just be like toddler scribbles. They're like, oh, hey. actually, Heath, my son likes to throw rocks. Mm, so it'd probably be like w- different size rocks that like are good for throwing <laughs> and like little pond areas. You know, I don't know. That's like my life right now. Simple. What would mine be? <laughs> I'm just like the law. Yeah, I feel like I'd see like like things like highlighted. Mm. Like if things were like going to provide me with useful information. Um, I'd see them highlighted in different colors. I don't actually have like the color coordinated system like a lot of law students do because it gave me too much anxiety to like assign like yellow is the holding and like blue is the defendant's argument or whatever. Like I like couldn't. I was like, what if I haven't need another color? Um, so I freaked out and I I don't do that. But I think that could be cool and also maybe what my site would be. <laughs> that sounds a lot more useful than mine. Um, which again is still kind of accurate to life right now. So. <laughs> I love my son. But what yeah, would the rocks just, mean? I don't know, man. It's a great question. Well, he likes the really f- big rocks that make the biggest splash. So mm-hmm. if we could, like, the big rocks, the really big rocks that <laughs> is, have, have to, we'd have to be able to see splashes on the site, too. Um, mm. That would be something significant or fun. Or just, like, mm. whereas, like, the little teeny pebble rocks, like, you can kind of ignore that stuff. Like the, big the site rocks. that sees fun is great. That'd be fun. <laughs> fun or excitement. Soft things. I mean, that's really what, yeah, he loves soft things so much. Like, it's silly. Anyway, um, I wish that I loved something as much as he loves soft things. Because, like, he loves soft things so much. <laughs> like, he has this little blanket he just carries with him, and he'll just, like, tackle, hug, hug you. Um, all right. Well, anyway, thanks for listening, guys. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please subscribe, share it with your friends, and leave a rating and review. If you'd like to support Wildbo as he continues to write fantastic stories, go to patreon.com slash Wildbo. You can follow the pod on Twitter at Pale Comparison or send us an email at paleincomparisonpod at gmail.com. Keep an eye out for our Reddit thread in our slash parahumans where you can answer our discussion question and share your thoughts on this episode in addition if you would like to see all of my predictions laid out check out our episode description for a link to a prediction tracker all right this week's fun fact is actually given to me by malia kind of blew my mind in 2015 the u.s supreme court ruled that a fish is not a tangible object I'll include a link in the episode description. Yeah, what the heck? In that case. <laughs> what? Yeah, Malia blew my mind. Uh, not really in a good way. <laughs> kind of like a... Uh, Statutory interpretation. Uh, gotta love law crap, I guess. Man. <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure a fish is a tangible object, but... What do I know? <laughs> I mean, sup- <laughs> the Supreme Court rules that... Five J- Supreme Court justices would say that you're wrong. <laughs> What did you say? It was five to four? It was five to four.
And it wasn't the traditional breakdown. It was real fun. Everyone should look at that Wikipedia page. Yeah, and become slightly more depressed. Um, I mean, maybe I mean, it's not depressing, but I, I kind of just... think that the holding is right. <laughs> okay, I apparently need to look at this Wikipedia page because I'm just <laughs> like, what? <laughs> okay, I'm pretty sure official official is a tangible object, guys. Can but apparently, it's construction. Not. Ruth Bader Ginsburg said that it wasn't so. Okay, so if she said that it wasn't, then I guess it <laughs> wasn't. Also, do you want to tell us who she cited for this case? Was that her that cited this? Or Oh, no. So Kagan um, wrote the dissent, and um, as part of her dissent where she was arguing that a fish is a tangible object, she cited Dr. Seuss, um, one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, to describe the fact that fish um, have... Oh, God, what is it? It's a really good quote. Sorry. A fish is, of course, a discrete thing that possesses physical form. (laughs) This is our country. you know. That we live in. Um, I don't know. Down with textualism. It's fine. (laughs) I'm going to take your word for that. Um, It just sounds sounds ridiculous. Uh, But that's why it's our fun fact for the week. So, um, all right. (laughs) That was a little longer than we usually spend talking about our fun fact, but um that just kind of blew my mind a little bit so it's a good one it's a good one all right have a good week you guys bye